Welcome. It is so good to be with you. I am Reverend Dr. Velda Love. I'm the lead for the Join the Movement Toward Racial Justice campaign and the Minister for Racial Justice at the United Church of Christ National Office. And it is exciting to be leading this campaign with uh, Dr. Sharon Finema, who's our curator. And we are looking forward to the next three years of leaning into stories from the local church and partnerships that are happening that are really moving racial justice. It is exciting to see you both, Reverend Amanda and Dr. Renee Harrison. Welcome to this exciting moment of your work. And we are uh, exceedingly excited to have you because you've been doing the work. And it really fits into the overall vision of the United Church of Christ, as well as the mission of joining the movement toward racial justice. So welcome. Yeah, I'm Sharon Fenema. I am the uh, Join the Movement curator and storyteller. So I have the blessing of being able to um, dwell with folks as they are sharing and telling their stories of anti-racism work within um, and in partnership with the United Church of Christ. Uh, stories are the heart of the Join the Movement Toward Racial Justice initiatives. As we know, as people of sacred story, the power of narrative to build compassion and inspire action. Our stories both show us who we are and help us imagine who we can be. Mm -hmm. So we are excited to be uh, in story sharing today with Reverend Amanda, Amanda Hendler Voss and Dr. Renee Harrison. And I just wondered if the two of you would just take a moment to introduce yourself. So I'm Dr. Renee K. Harrison. I'm Associate Professor of African American and U.S. Religious History at Howard University School of Divinity. I've been at Howard for, wow, 12 years now. And so I'm elated to be a part of this conversation, which is um, an expression of the work that I'm doing with Dr. Voss, Hendler Voss, and also within my own work and research. So I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this conversation. And I'm Reverend Amanda Hendler Voss. I currently serve as the senior minister at First Congregational United Church of Christ in Washington, DC. It is a joy to be here and to share a little bit more about the partnership that our congregation shares with Howard University and the ways that that is embodied in um, some of the work that Dr. Harrison is doing with us right now. So Reverend Amanda, maybe uh, tell us a little bit more about your congregation and what has called you to the work of racial justice. Sure, I'll begin with the congregation. We were founded in 1865. Mm -hmm. um, and one of our founders, um, General Oliver Otis Howard, is um, also one of the founders of Howard University um, and Howard University's namesake. Um, we were founded by a group of abolitionists who had a, um, a deep care about uh, freedom for those who had been enslaved. At the same time, and this is a nuance that I think we're learning to talk about uh, more honestly, not all abolitionists believed in full equality. And so about four years into the life of our congregation, there was a major rupture over the issue of integration around the communion table. And the church literally split in two um, the pastor and a group who did not support an integrated communion table left. Mm -hmm. And those who remained, um, were faced with the prospect of how they would, um, be able to afford to pay for the building. Howard university at that point, my understanding is stepped in and paid the note. And so um, our relationship, it's a story I like to tell because our relationship with Howard University 
um, is, is complex and it is even now actively emerging in the present moment. And I uh, know that you've done, um, you've mentioned the historical work um, that you've done. And I know Dr. Harrison has been a big part of that work. So I wonder if you just, um, if both of you would share a little bit about how that collaboration came to be and, and what you've discovered in it. Seven years ago, um, I was a part of the 150th anniversary celebration, and I gave the keynote address. And part of what my work has been doing in the city is excavating the story, right? I'm, I'm so particularly moved by Barbara Brown Zuckman's assessment that hidden histories are the histories that are relegated to the corners of society. And if we continue on that path, that those hidden histories will unearth themselves and, and cause quite pain for America. And so um, I'm so vested in hidden histories. And I came to the church to give the 150th keynote address. And I told the story of Sherman and, and others and, and their valid you know, uh, quest to be a part of the abolitionist movement and help to move the city beyond slavery to a new identity. And so I gave that valiant, triumphant UCC congregationalist um, <laughs> um, take on, you know, America is this patriotic place that's so desiring to help um, the formerly enslaved persons post-slavery. And then after I told that story that we know, that normative victor story that we kind of, you know, acquiesced to, I began to excavate the story beneath that. And... Um, it, it caused some in the congregation to dig deeper in terms of what they didn't know. And so I talked about the, the church itself sits on a tobacco plantation owned by one of the original proprietors, um, land proprietors of Washington, D.C. that um, George Washington actually purchased the land from. And actually the Burns family was the last holdout. They did not want to sell their property um, to Washington, um, they were looking for more profit from the endeavor. Eventually they did, uh, his daughter assumed ownership of the land. And so eventually they did, and they were able to build Washington DC. And so I, I kind of talk about that history of what it means to be a place of faith, to do the anti-racist work and worship every Sunday, knowing that you're standing on the grounds of a former tobacco plantation. And also aware that you're in a city that has, that has relegated um, the serene, beautiful um, atmosphere or environment of the mall was once the largest slave market in the nation. And what does that mean to know that the church played a major role in that endeavor? And so it was from that keynote address that Meg McGuire um, was so moved and she went on to um, contemplate what it means to do anti-racist work in a way that's tangible. And so what she sought to do was to um, erect an enslaved memorial in front of the church um, in honor of those that, that were once there. And so that has just created a movement. And when Amanda came, which Amanda, I'll, I'll let her tell the story of how we already knew each other. I love when she tells that story. So I'll let her. But um, so when Amanda came, she just, you know, kind of spearheaded that movement. And so we're now engaged in an endeavor to put an enslaved memorial um, in every ward of the city. So I think there's seven to eight wards in Washington, D.C. And so the goal is to have an enslaved memorial in every ward and hopefully to lead to one on the National Mall. And so that's the work um, that I've been doing with First Congregational Church. Yeah, I wonder if you, maybe you, the two of you would just say a little bit more about kind of what these, I, I'm re recognizing that we're um, recording this interview in February, which in the US is Black History Month. And it, it is making me think about um, what is the connection that you're, experiencing between um, history and anti-racism from a faith perspective? Like, what is that? You're, you're, you're sort of touching on it just now, uh, Reverend Amanda, but I wonder if you'd say more, or Dr. Harrison, about what that connection is between these historical 
these stories and anti-racism and and our faith, um, our spiritual practices. So um, one of the things when I was listening to Amanda from Saturday's conversation, I shared the story of Emily and Mary Edmondson, who were a part of the Pearl story, 76 uh, enslaved persons that fled to the DC wharf in an attempt to run away from um, their masters who were, who was the US president, vice president, uh, Supreme Court justices, uh, dignitaries, clergy, so on and so forth. But they ran, they took the risks and they ran and um, they headed, um, they headed on a steamer, 65 foot vessel, um, spearheaded or um, commandeered by two white men. And so the, uh, Daniel Drayton was significant in this. He was actually known for participating in fugitive slave voyages. And so he took a risk and he helped them aboard the, um, the steamer. They headed down the river, uh, down the Potomac, but a, a wind caught and they had to you know, pause and wait for a few hours before they could get back on the water, but that didn't work. And so um, that next morning, slave owners awoke to the reality that their help had was gone. So they went on this rampage to, to find them and they found the schooner and they brought them back. They paraded them back across the mall. Um, Drayton was, um, was lashed, you know, he received a um, a knife, a wound from a knife from one of the persons that were protesting his involvement. And they were, he was jailed along with the other um, uh, white captain. And so I'm, I'm sharing that story because it, 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 it was clear to me when Drayton and I, and I highlight Drayton, even though there were, there was another, um, the captain was a white male. I'm, I highlight Drayton because he was a man of faith that wasn't a particular white benevolent Christian, right? I'm doing this thing because it's it's the thing that makes me look good and it's the thing that I should do. And, you know, look at me, great Christian. He did it knowing that anti-racist work is about divestment, right? He had to divest himself of something, his life, in order to participate in the work of helping those that are disenfranchised. So he took that risk. He went to jail. It wasn't until Fillmore became president that he, um, it wasn't until he became president that he pardoned him, but he was faced with a $76,000 bond, $1,000 for each enslaved person he helped to escape. So I share that story because these are all people of faith, right? And it occurs to me historically that they become our models about what it means to be people of faith that do anti-racist work. Okay. It's cute to talk about it, but it's different to get your hands dirty. Right. And to say that divestment means as a person of faith, as a person of God, it means that I have to, I have to take some persecution and I have to be willing to risk my life in order to save others. And that is a different kind of benevolence. So Dr. Harrison, um, as you describe, um, this history, as well as the sacrifices that that are made, have been made over the last 500 years. What does it mean when we put our bodies on the line and, and teaching theologically and biblically, as well as being in a community? Um, what does that mean? And because there is this conversation about uh, people of African descent mm -hmm. have done their work. Mm -hmm. And yes. how do we talk about and live into this reparations reality if we don't have solidarity partners yeah. who are willing to put their lives on the line? Can you yeah. speak to that? Sure. I, I think it, it's what I left with at the conversation the other night about fear, right? Um, it, it, it occurred to me when someone raised the question to me about whether or not my publication had footnotes. And I and it, it when the question came, I was I was you know, I was taken back, but I was trying to be diplomatic, but I knew I had to come back to the question. And Amanda in her brilliant way allowed the space for me to come back to that question. But I came back to the question with the idea that the victor has to be, has to be intentional about expanding the story. The victor has to be, because the victor is not asked about footnotes. 
Only people like me are asked about footnotes. And when the victor tells the story in a way that's truth telling, the victor is saying that not only their body of work and the history from which they come from is sacred, but so is their physicality, their own body is sacred. And that is the act of ministry. I think um, this idea that black people have to sacrifice their bodies, we've done it. Right. Now we need to bear witness of white people on the cross. That's the witness we need to see. And that is the redemption. And I'm, I'm clear about that more than I ever have been, that the fact that I'm writing a book, making the request that enslaved Black people deserve a memorial, that's preposterous. I mean, downright preposterous. Um, when LaFont passed because of the way he was treated by George Washington and, and treated by um, Thomas Jefferson, when he passed, he also died penniless in a grave that was embarrassing. But it took Christian people in the city, in, the, in Washington, D.C., to come together to demand that the government move his body in Arlington. So I know that the church as a body and individual bodies play a central role in how America is shaped, because it did from the beginning and how America tells the story now. It's everyday Christians. And that is the work of ministry. That is the sacrifice of the body. And that is the message. You know, earlier this year, um, Dr. Harrison brought a production um, that was part of Howard's School of Divinity um, to First Church. And um, it involved in the beginning really hard hitting truth telling about our the current state of black lives in the United States and the and the violence the everyday violence um over and over there were images there was audio i've never heard um it was very powerful that was followed by a gorgeous dancer coming into the space and embodying the emotion that all of that had kicked up in us with her actual body. And it was, it was a beautiful, strong, powerful. Um, there were moments, you know, that sort of trembled with lament and, um, and then there was a healing ritual all of this was followed by open conversation. And in that conversation, in the sanctuary, all of this took place in the sanctuary. Um, there was a black man who broke down into tears talking about what it felt like to live in America right now and to know that you can't really protect your family. You can't really, when they walk out the door. It was some of the most honest conversation I have had in recent years. And it was a mixed crowd. It was an intergenerational crowd. I'm quite sure it was probably an interfaith crowd. Um, and that is what Dr. Harrison's work does, is it it sort of um, combines this really hard hitting truth telling that has to be, these truths have to be told along with the beauty and the ritual that can take us by the hand through toward healing um, and creates community in the midst of that. So that honest dialogue and true listening can take place. Um, I am honored to think that that conversation happened in our sanctuary, and I can think of no better purpose than worship 
for the sanctuary. And that's, this was a form of worship taking place there through the dance, through the ritual, through the conversation, through the, through the coming together. It becomes possible when, when churches open their doors. I mean, I was able to, that work existed because Amanda and the church opened its doors. And what she's not saying that's, it, that was powerful is that she was a part of that talk back panel. So I had a UC, um, Ron Hobson, who is a professor at Howard, but also a UCC uh, minister and Amanda. And then I had a um, psychologist. And so they, they were the ones on the panel and they shepherded that conversation into light. But it was a difficult conversation, but it's possible. So I, I want to just pause there just to say thank you for that. And also that these conversations are possible when churches open their doors. Yes, yes. Thank you and so I, much. I just want to add to that. I'm grateful to the Join the Movement campaign because we know that this world is split and we are called to mend it. And you are stitching together stories of, you know, what happens in Washington, D.C. with stories of churches in the South, with stories of churches out West and in New England. And we need that stitching. We need to hear from one another. The stories that I hear about work that other churches are, are doing, that inspires me and encourages me and bolsters me. And, and, I, and so I hope what we've shared here today does the same for them. Finding each other.